Good morning. The chapter for today is pollination and fertilization. The subtopics covered in this chapter are self pollination, cross pollination, artificial pollination, fertilization and development of the seed. Let's understand what pollination is. Pollination is a transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma. There are three ways in which pollination can occur. Autogamy. Pollen grains may be transferred from the anther to the stigma of the same flower itself. Gitanogamy. Pollen grains of a flower may fall on the stigma of a different flower on the same plant. Allogamy Pollen grains of a flower may fall on the stigma of a flower of another plant of the same species. Pollination occurs between plants of the same species. There are two ways of pollination. One is self-pollination, the second one being cross-pollination. Self-pollination. What is self-pollination? Transfer of pollen grains from anther to the stigma of the same flower, which is autogamy, onto the stigma of another flower of the same plant. Gitanogamy is known as self-pollination. When does self-pollination occur? Self-pollination generally takes place in bisexual flowers because they have both male and female gametes in the same flower. It may also occur between unisexual flowers in the same plant. As the genetic makeup of gametes is identical in flowers on the same plant, the new plants formed resemble the parent plant. How are flowers adapted for self-pollination? For example, in rice, wheat and mirabilis jalapa, the anther and stigma mature at the same time. This is known as homogamy. Some bisexual flowers remain closed all their life so that their own pollen can easily pollinate the stigma of the flower. This is known as cleistogamy. Cleistogamy is found in flowers of Comalina species which remain underground. Advantages of self-pollination Self-pollination is easy and most likely to occur as stamens and carpels mature at the same time. It preserves the parental characters indefinitely because the gametes of the same flower or flowers of the same plant are involved. Small quantity of pollen is sufficient, thus it is economical for the plant. Flowers need not produce nectar and scent. They need not be showy. Flowers generally do not depend on pollinating agents. Let's see the disadvantages of self-pollination. As self-pollination occurs regularly, generation after generation, it leads to loss of vigor and vitality of the plant variety. Repeated self-pollination produces poor quality seeds that produce weak offsprings. The genetic defects of plant variety cannot be eliminated New varieties cannot be obtained by self-pollination. This is because no intermixing of genetic makeup of different plant varieties occurs and same genetic traits are passed on to the next generation. Cross-pollination The transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower of one plant to the stigma of flower of another plant of the same species is known as cross-pollination or allogamy. Cross-pollination occurs in unisexual as well as bisexual flowers. 
It involves two separate plants of the same species and pollinating agents. Let's see the advantages of cross-pollination. Seeds produced contain another source of genetic material which may contain genes which were advantages for the survival of the seedlings. The seeds produced are viable and healthier and have better germinating capacity. Seeds produce healthier offsprings. Cross-pollination is a source of variation in offsprings because of intermixing of genetic makeup of two plants. Disadvantages of cross-pollination Pollination is uncertain because plants have to depend on external agents for pollination, which may or may not be available at the right time. The pollen grains have to be produced in larger amounts to ensure their availability for pollination. Thus, a lot of pollen is wasted in this way. The process is not economical because the flowers have to adapt themselves to attract pollinating agents. This means that they have to be large, showy, colorful, scented and produce nectar. Sometimes cross-pollination may lead to a poor quality seeds because of mixing of some feeble genotypes of one or both of the parent plants. Let's see how does nature favor cross-pollination. Nature favors cross-pollination through a variety of adaptations. In other words, these are the mechanisms to prevent self-pollination. Unisexuality. Flowers may be only male or female and born either on the same plant, for example, maize, cucumber, castor, or on different plants, for example, palm, papaya, and mulberry. Dichogamy. The timings of maturation of androecium and gynoecium may be different, known as dichogamy. This difference in timings of maturation acts as a barrier in self-pollination. In plants such as okra, sweet peas, salvia, etc., anthers of flowers mature earlier than the stigma, known as protandry. In plants such as custard apple, people, etc., the stigma matures earlier than the anther, known as protogamy. Self-sterility in some plants, like apples and grapes, pollen grains of a flower fail to fertilize the flower of the same plant, but fertilize the stigma of flower born on another plant of the same species. This is known as self-sterility. For this reason, the apple growers cultivate many plants and often more than one variety of apple trees in their gardens. Hercogamy. In this condition, anther and stigma are so placed in a flower that pollen grains from the anther are unable to reach the stigma of the same flower. Thus the term hercogamy. For example, a hood covers the stigma in a pansy flower which acts as a barrier. The pollen grains are liberated outside the flower in gloriosa thereby preventing them from reaching the stigma of the same flower. Heterostyly Some plants such as primrose have flowers in which the length of style and the position of anthers is different. One type bears stamens at higher level and style is short while the other type bears flowers with long style and short stamens. This prevents self-pollination and cross-pollination by insects is the only method. Let's see the differences between self-pollination and cross-pollination based on the following characteristics. Occurrence In self-pollination, it occurs within a flower or between two flowers of the same plant. In cross-pollination, it occurs between two flowers of different plants of the same species. Agent of pollination 
in self pollination no external agent is required in cross pollination external agents such as wind water insects birds and animals are required production of pollen grains in self pollination it is produced in small numbers no wastage of pollen grains occur in cross pollination it is produced in large numbers usually wastage of pollen grains occur appearance of flowers in self pollination flowers are not attractive in cross pollination flowers are attractive with colored petals fragrance and nectar in self pollination flowers do not produce scent or nectar in cross pollination flowers generally produce scent and nectar nature of offspring produced in self pollination offspring produced have genetic makeup identical to the parent plant purity of race maintained no variation occurs in cross pollination offspring produced may differ in genetic makeup and variation occurs mechanisms of cross pollination there are two main groups of agents of cross pollination these are abiotic agents like wind and water biotic agents like insects birds and mammals let's see abiotic agents wind pollination or anemophily many flowers are anemophilous or wind pollinated it is not an efficient method for pollination because pollen must be produced in large quantity so that some of them may land on receptive stigma of the flower to be pollinated grass maize hazel and willow are some examples of plants pollinated by wind Most wind pollinated flowers have the following characteristic features which increase the chance of pollen reaching the stigma Large amount of pollen is produced so that pollen grain has an adequate chance of reaching a stigma The flowers are usually small flowers have long stalk or above the leaves so that they are clearly exposed to air small light dry and smooth pollen grains are produced which can be easily carried out even by slightest breeze flowers have large stamens which have long filaments so that they can hang well outside the flower and are loosely attached so that they can sway and shake out pollen in lightest breeze flowers have feathery stigma which spreads out and acts like a net catching pollen as it floats through air flowers have no petals or have very small inconspicuous petals which are often white or green that is not brightly colored flowers do not produce scent or nectar that is nectaries are absent altogether water pollination or hydrophily pollination by water is not common but a few aquatic plants such as seed grasses valesneria and water weeds release their pollen in water which is passively carried to other flowers by water currents flowers pollinated by water show following characteristic features pollen grains are produced in large numbers so that they have enough chances of reaching the stigma plants are dioecious that is male and female flowers are born on separate plants flowers are usually small and inconspicuous in some plants pollen grains have specific gravity equal to water so that they can float below the water surface they have very light flowers which can float easily on water surface biotic agents pollination by insects or entomophily 
Many flowers are pollinated by insects. The best known example is of honeybees. Wasps, moths and butterflies also pollinate flowers. Buttercup, sweet pea, dandelion and many vegetables are some examples of flowers pollinated by insects. These flowers have some or all of the following characters which attract insects and ensure pollination. The flowers are large and often brightly colored. Example, bright red bracts of hot lips plant attract insects to pollinate its small flowers. The petals are scented with nectaries. They produce nectar which serve as food for the insects. Some flowers have petals with grooves or dark lines which lead to nectaries. These are known as honey guides or nectar guides. Many flowers have markings which are visible in ultraviolet light. Bees can see in ultraviolet light and thus can recognize and pollinate flowers. The pollen grains are large. In some plants, the pollen grains are smooth and sticky. In others, they are covered with spiny hair. Both these features help pollen grains cling to insect bodies. Pollen grains are produced in small quantity. Anthers are small with short filament situated inside the flower where insects can easily brush against them. The stigma is sticky, flat or knob-like and secretes a sugary fluid to which pollen grains become attached. Stigma does not hang out from the flower. Many moth and butterfly pollinated flowers are white or yellow in color so that they can be easily seen during night and pollinated by them. Let's understand the differences between insect pollinated and wind pollinated flowers based on the following characteristics. Color and size of the petals. In insect pollinated flowers, it is large and brightly colored and showy. In wind pollinated flowers, it is small and white colored, not showy. Fragrance. In insect pollinated flowers, it produces scent. In wind pollinated flowers, it does not produce scent. Nectar. In insect pollinated flowers, it produces copious amount of nectar. In wind pollinated flowers, it does not produce nectar. Anther. In insect pollinated flowers, anthers with short filaments. In wind pollinated flowers, anthers with long filaments, which are exposed themselves to air. Pollen grains. In insect pollinated flowers, it is produced in small quantity. In wind pollinated flowers, it is produced in large quantity. Stigma. In insect pollinated flowers, it is sticky, flat or knob-like. In wind pollinated flowers, it is large. Nectar guides. In insect pollinated flowers, it is usually present. In wind pollinated flowers, it is usually absent. Essential roles. In insect pollinated flowers, not much is exposed to wind. In wind pollinated flowers, it is much exposed to wind. Examples of insect pollinated flowers are salvia, petunia, pea, buttercup, and dandelion. Examples of wind pollinated flowers are maize, pine, and wheat. Pollination by animals or zoophily. Pollination by birds or ornithophily. Many flowers are pollinated by birds. For example, begonia and canna. The birds including hummingbirds, etc. The flowers pollinated by birds are usually bright red or yellow in color with very little odor as birds do not have a keen sense of smell but have excellent vision. 
Flowers are usually large or are a part of a large inflorescence. Flowers produce large amount of nectar in long floral tubes so that it is not consumed by insects. Pollination by mammals. Many mammals such as bats, squirrels and elephants are useful pollinators of some plants. Pollination by elephant is found in Rafflesia whose flowers are very large and at ground level. The pollen grains of one of the flowers may get attached to the feet of an elephant and when it steps on or touches the other flower, they get transferred to the stigma of the other flower. Bat pollinated flowers are found primarily in tropics and open only at night when bats are foraging. The bat pollinated flowers are large in size or consist of ball-like inflorescence and have a dull color. Let's see what artificial pollination is. Sometimes man artificially transfers pollens to the stigma known as artificial pollination. Artificial pollination is a standard practice to produce new plant varieties. Pollen grains are carefully removed from the mature anthers and are placed on the mature stigma of another flower of the same plant or other plant of same species. These are then kept under ideal conditions till fruits and seeds are produced. The positive seeds produced are germinated and this whole process is repeated several times till new positive varieties are produced. Artificial pollination is common in crops like wheat and maize and garden plants like pansy and stalk. Let's understand some basic terms before going to the subtopic fertilization. Pollen grain. A pollen grain is a microscopic structure covered by a two-layered wall, the inner intine and the outer exine. It has two nuclei, a tube nucleus and a generative male nucleus. Ovule. An ovule is a small structure contained in the ovary. Each ovule is surrounded by integuments, that is, two-layered ovule has an opening to one side called micropyle for entry of pollen tubes. Each ovule contains an embryo sac where seven cells are present, three cells at micropylar end, one egg cell and two synergids, three cells at opposite end, three antipodal cells, one central cell containing two polar nuclei. Fertilization and development of the seed. There are various steps of fertilization and development of the seed. Pollination brings female and male gametophytes together. For the egg to be fertilized, the male and female gametophytes must meet and unite their gametes. This is done by pollination in which pollen grains is placed on the stigma of the carpel. Germination of pollen grains occurs. Under suitable conditions, the cytoplasm of the pollen grains absorbs sugar and water from the stigma and bulges out to produce a tube known as pollen tube by breaking down exine of pollen grains. This tube grows down through stigma and style towards the ovary. This tube produces chemicals calcium that dissolve the tissues of the style and the tip of the pollen tube enters the ovary through micropylar end. The generated nucleus of pollen grain divides by mitosis and forms two male gamete nuclei also known as sperm nuclei. The pollen grain with a tube containing two male gametes constitutes mature male gametophyte. The ovule contains the egg cell inside the embryo sac. The tip of the pollen tube after entering the ovary probes through the micropyle, ruptures 
and discharges the two male gametes into embryo sac. One of the male gametes fuses with the egg to form the zygote. This fusion is called fertilization. Another male gamete fuses with the diploid secondary nucleus which is called fusion product of two polar nuclei and forms the endosperm, a food storing tissue. In the next slide, we will see the detailed diagram of fertilization and development of the seed. Let's understand the nature of nuclear structures formed at the end. Male gamete 1n plus egg cell 1n is equals to zygote 2n. Male gamete 1n plus secondary nucleus 2n is equals to endosperm 3n. The following diagram shows the process of fertilization with longitudinal section of pistil showing fertilization, mature pollen grain, pollen grain germinating on stigma, a germinated pollen grain, ovule showing the embryo sac in it and events occurring there. Double fertilization and triple fusion. As this process involves the fusion of two male gametes separately, one with the egg and the other with the secondary nucleus, this process of fertilization is called double fertilization. Since three nuclei are involved in this fusion, it is called triple fusion. As a result, a diploid zygote and a triploid endosperm nucleus are formed. The zygote divides several times and forms an embryo, while the endosperm nucleus grows to form the endosperm. The ovule develops into a seed, an embryo with a supply of nutrients in the seed coat. Following fertilization, the sepals, petals, style and stigma degenerate and usually fall off. The ovary wall ripens and forms the pericarp of the fruit. The ovule develops into a seed. The endosperm cell divides to form the endosperm or nutritive tissue which supplies food to the developing embryo. The seed contains a potential plant or embryo. The embryo contains a tiny root radical, a small shoot called plumule and cotyledons. There are two cotyledons in dicots, one cotyledon in monocots. As the seed matures, it hardens and dries, enabling it to survive in adverse environmental conditions. The embryo and its food supply are enclosed by seed coat formed from the integuments of the ovule. The ovary develops into a fruit. The whole ovary after fertilization changes into a fruit which protects the enclosed seed. The wall of the ovary may harden and become a pod as in poppy or it may become fleshy and succulent as in plums or tomatoes. There may be one or more seeds in a fruit. When the fruit is ripe, contents are released by the fruit and seeds are dispersed. The embryo lies dormant in the seed. At the onset of favorable conditions, it becomes active and germinates into a small seedling through a seed germination process.